Welcome, Dan Mama. Sega's first console, the SG-1000, was first released in 1983 on the exact same day as its biggest rival, the Nintendo Famicom. However, despite Sega's huge success in the arcade market, the console failed to capture a significant slice of the home market, with sales of less than 1 million units. Despite its relative lack of success, there were still two further models of the system produced, the officially licensed Othello Multivision and the redesigned SG-1000 Mark II. Interestingly, this model number is what led to the original version of the Mars system being called the Mark III in Japan. There are a number of different reasons that are cited for its lack of success. Firstly, the inferior hardware when compared to the Famicom, most notably in the areas of colours and sprites, which led to similar games always looking worse on Sega's system. The game's library was nowhere near as strong either, with just over 70 games being released for the console. The bizarre thing about this is that Sega actually managed to pump out 21 games in the first year of release, compared to just 9 from Nintendo, but Sega have since admitted that they failed to capitalise on this early boost, and didn't really take the console market seriously until they saw the huge success of the Famicom, by which time it was too late. The SG-1000 has an interesting legacy in video game history though, Firstly, because it was the original home of Yuji Naka, who would go on to create Sonic the Hedgehog amongst many other big hits. It also became the first system to be released in both console and computer form simultaneously, being joined by its slick looking sibling, the SC3000. It was also one of the first systems to be based on what became known as the MSX standard, and was almost identical to the ColecoVision on a hardware level. Lastly, due to the Mars system being based on an upgraded version of the SG-1000 hardware, it was backwards compatible with all its games, making it one of the very first consoles to have such a feature, only being beaten by the rival Atari 7800. Despite Sega's recent attempts to embrace its retro gaming roots, they seem to have totally ignored the existence of the SG-1000, which is a shame given the system's legacy, but one person who certainly hasn't ignored it is me. I have previously produced an amazing facts episode on the console, as well as a game compilation video both of which are linked in the description for those who are interested. And it's only right that I also look at the best exclusives the SG-1000 and SC-3000 have to offer too. Now, let's get on with the show. Based on the popular Japanese anime Super Dimension Century August, this is a horizontally scrolling shoot 'em up designed for the SG-1000 by Sega themselves. The gimmick of this game is that you can transform into a robot from a spaceship and then back again at will. Each formation has its own advantages and disadvantages that affect the way you play the game. In robot mode you can destroy ground based targets and have much greater freedom of movement across the screen, but this is at the expense of being a bigger target for enemies. You also have a much faster rate of fire, but move a lot slower as a consequence. When transitioned into a ship, you cannot destroy ground targets, but you're less likely to be destroyed thanks to being a lot smaller and harder to hit. Your ship is also much faster than the robot, but cannot rapid fire. The game has four levels in total that pretty much play exactly the same, but with new background graphics to make them feel a little bit different. For an SG-1000 game this looks really nice, and even features some parallax scrolling, which you pretty much never see on this machine. The sound effects are pretty decent, and there's a short tune when you start each level. Overall, August is a pretty generic shoot em up in many ways, but the unique license and robot transformation gimmick make it seem a lot more appealing.
what you're thinking. Super Hang On is the sequel to Hang On, right? Well, yes and no. As technically speaking, it's actually the third game in the franchise due to the existence of this, the very little known Hang On 2 for the Sega SG-1000. But the name is perhaps a little bit misleading, because it actually appears to be a downgraded version of the Master System port of the original Hang On. The only real differences are the downgraded graphics and the addition of music from the arcade version of the game. Not that this is a bad thing of course, because it meant that SG-1000 owners got to enjoy a great version of Sega's classic bike racer without having to make the expensive hardware upgrade. There are five stages here to race through, Circuit, Seaside, Monument Valley, City Night and Circuit. You have just 60 seconds to reach each checkpoint, with it being automatically extended by a further 60 as you pass. And this is key, because unlike many other racing games of the era, this is a pure race against the clock, with the other bikers acting merely as obstacles and nothing more. Your bike has three gears that are operated by pressing up and down on the controller, with the two buttons operating as your brake and accelerator. The visuals here are really nice, with a good sense of speed, and the music is top notch. Hang On 2 is the best bike racing game available for the SG-1000. Sega Master System owners will more than likely be aware of a fun little beat em up for their console called Kung Fu Kid, which was reskinned as a Sapo Soul game for the Brazilian market. Well, if you are, you'll no doubt be pleased to discover that it had a prequel on the SG-1000 in the form of this game, Dragon Wang. For gigglesome name aside, this is a pretty slick game for Sega's first console, where you're on a mission to rescue your girlfriend who's being held in the rather menacing sounding Castle of Evil. In essence, it's a clone of Irem's hugely popular Kung Fu Master, which is credited as being the very first scrolling beat em up ever, and it features many of the same gameplay mechanics. So you simply walk around the 2D stages, duffing up the bad guys and dodging their attacks. But there are a few little differences, most notably in the way you fight the bosses. Each stage has at least three of these, and once defeated, these super enemies drop a key. You have to collect all these keys to complete the level, and they also have an added benefit of topping up your health. The other key change is in the level structure. Unlike Kung Fu Master, you can now move between the floors of the building at will, which is needed to find and defeat all the bosses. Dragon Wang has lovely colourful sprites, great music and compelling gameplay, making it a bit of a hidden gem. Not to be confused with a series of tank arcade games by Atari, Sega's Super Tank seems to have a pretty strong connection to another similarly named arcade game, SNK's Tank. Although there seems to be no licensing in place, Super Tank very much seems to follow the same gameplay characteristics as SNK's game, which was an unofficial prequel to the hugely successful Akari Warriors. As you probably gathered already from my intro to this review, Super Tank is a variation on the vertically scrolling one-man army genre, popularised by the likes of Frontline, Commando and indeed the aforementioned Akari Warriors. But rather than controlling a vulnerable soldier, you get to drive a tank across the battlefield taking out enemy installations, other armoured vehicles and recovering supplies. Your tank has unlimited standard ammo, but is also equipped with a limited number of rockets, which are especially useful defeating the end of level bosses. 
A mini map at the side of the screen shows you the location of enemy installations, but there's actually no requirement to destroy them all. Interestingly, this impressive game was coded by one Mitsuhiro Fuji, who is Sega's longest serving employee, having worked on such classics as Sonic Adventure, Knights, Golden Axe, Space Harrier and Fantasy Star. He now serves on the company's board of directors. Many of you out there will have played the historic Sega arcade game head on, or indeed one of the many conversions and clones of the game like Dodgem on the Atari 2600, or Synapse Software's Dodge Racer. It's credited as one of the inspirations for Pac-Man, with both the maze concept and collection of dots being borrowed for Namco's game. Although there was a head on 2 that simply added a 2 player mode to the game, the true sequel is actually this SG-1000 exclusive, Pac-R. And this is where it gets quite interesting because Pac-R then borrows some elements from Pac-Man to bring things full circle. So now collecting the dots is a requirement rather than just a bonus, and there are large dots that act just like the power pellets in Pac-Man, allowing you to eliminate the rival cars without crushing and dying. There is also now a garage in the centre of the screen that spawns enemy cars, acting much like the ghost house in Pac-Man. One thing that is radically different however, is the way your car controls because you can't simply change direction on a whim here, you can only go forward or switch your car into reverse, which is much slower. So it's only really useful if you miss a turning. Pacar has fairly simple graphics and sound, but the gameplay more than makes up for it, as it provides an addictive and enjoyable update on an already winning concept. Also known as Video Flipper, this is a pinball game for the SG-1000 as the title very much suggests, and just the type of game I always seek out on any console I come across. It's a fairly simple affair in most regards with just one fixed screen table, and your usual array of bumpers and flippers, but what is quite new and original is the way this table is designed. Firstly there's the mini table in the top left, which has its own set of little flippers, and a little goal at the top, which awards you with a big bonus if you hit it. Then there is the blocker. This is a special bumper that can be moved into one of three predefined positions. Every time you activate the flipper, this moves a position. So if you move it quick enough, you use it to deflect the ball back up the table. More standard features include drop bumpers, hit all of these and you gain an extra ball, bonus multipliers, and a two player mode where you take it in turns to compete for the high score. There's no multi ball feature sadly, or any way to tilt the table. This array of interesting features does help distract somewhat from the janky ball physics but you can certainly live with this and it doesn't make Flipper any less fun. The visuals are very colourful, the sound effects are top notch and the controls are nice and responsive too. Every console needs a good pinball game in my opinion and Flipper more than fits the bill.
One of the few third party games released for the SG-1000, Spain Spouting comes courtesy of Sakuda Original, who also sold their own version of the console called the Othello Multivision. The name has nothing to do with the ride at Walt Disney World, or indeed the place where Ric Flair takes his women. Woo! Sega Space Mountain was actually inspired by the iconic 1977 movie Star Wars, as many shoot 'em ups of the era were of course, but this one is a bit more blatant than most. Your ship is quite obviously an X-Wing, and the goal of the game is to eliminate the enemy squadrons and infiltrate and ultimately blow up their base, which is done via a trench sequence of course. On the screen you see your ship from a third person perspective, a crosshair that you can use to aim your weapon, an info panel showing you how many ships you need to eliminate, and just below that is a scanner to help you anticipate the enemy attacks. There's also other info displayed around the play area, like your current score, high score, lives and what level you're on. The first part is just shooting enemies, but once into the trench you'll also have to avoid space mines too. Once you complete both sections, you simply do the same all over again, only harder. Ok, so Space Mountain isn't the most impressive game on the SG-1000, but the Star Wars connection certainly makes it somewhat more interesting. I know what you're saying, Congo Bongo isn't an SG-1000 exclusive, as it's a port of the Sega arcade game, right? Well, yes and no, because Congo Bongo was most certainly a Sega arcade game, but the SG-1000 version most certainly isn't a port, it would be fairer to call it a reimagining. You see, the original coin-up and all the other home ports in fact used a 3D isometric perspective, but this version swaps that out for a flat 2D viewpoint based on the same ideas. It also has only two stages that repeat with a harder difficulty, as opposed to the arcade games 4. So the first part of the game is still very much the same concept, with you trying to get to the top of a mountain whilst avoiding the projectiles being thrown at you by an angry ape, as well as his minions. The new 2D perspective makes this feel even more like Donkey Kong than it did in the arcades. The second stage still has many elements borrowed from Frogger, but again, plays and looks very differently to its arcade counterpart. Instead of a horizontal viewpoint, we now move to a top-down perspective where you're trying to negotiate a series of small islands whilst avoiding a number of different land and water-based baddies. The colourful visuals in Congo Bongo are really attractive, and the sound and music suits the game perfectly. Dare I say it, I actually preferred this version to the coin-op, finding it a lot less frustrating. This excellent rally driving game from Sega is particularly notable for two different things. Firstly, the fact it was the first home console game to use officially licensed cars, with you driving a Lancia Stratos and opponent cars that include an Audi Quattro and Porsche 911. And the second point leads straight on from the last one, as the main car in this game would of course go on to be an unlockable extra in this superb Sega Saturn port of Sega Rally. The name of this game is certainly very appropriate as your race surroundings are very important here. As you race across the African plains, local wildlife is on the move too, with wildebeest, lions, leopards, elephants, rhinos and much more getting in your way. Colliding with one of these rogue animals or other obstacles like rocks will cause one of your tyres to burst, and you only have four replacements. You're also racing against the time limit and have limited fuel too, although the latter could be topped up by stopping at a petrol pump. 
There are three stages to get through with a checkpoint at the end of each one where your time is reset. Your car has both high and low gears, brakes and even a horn for warning those pesky animals. The visuals in this game are absolutely fantastic, up there amongst the best in the machine, and the music that speeds up as you do is a really nice touch. Safari Race is a bona fide SG-1000 essential. somebody asked you to name a legendary Sega games designer, I'm pretty sure that the first name in your lips would be Yuji Naka. After all, this was the man behind such highly acclaimed titles as Sonic the Hedgehog, Knights, Fantasy Star, Burning Rangers and Choo Choo Rocket. But where did Yuji Naka get his start in video games? On the Sega SG-1000 of course, its very first title being the excellent and totally exclusive Girls Garden. This game is notable in a number of different regards. Firstly, for being one of the very first home console games to feature a female protagonist. Secondly, for being one of the SG-1000's few exclusives. And lastly, for its highly original gameplay design that follows a girl called Papri as she gathers flowers to try and win the love of a local boy. Papri must collect 10 of these flowers and return them to her boyfriend's house to win the game. As she moves around the horizontally scrolling playfield, she must watch out for bears and avoid the many obstacles in her path. The flowers themselves must be caught in full bloom. Picking flowers too early doesn't increase your flower count, and collecting wilted flowers has a very detrimental effect, ruining your bouquet and halving your existing count. It's a shame Naka never developed any further games for the SG-1000, because Girl's Garden is undoubtedly one of the system's most impressive games. And that runs up my look at 10 amazing SG-1000 and SC-3000 exclusives. Can you think of any other one-off titles that only ever came out for this classic 8-bit console? Or do you think some of these games were unworthy of inclusion? We also love to hear the thoughts and views of my audience, so please get typing in that comments section. Before I go though, I must thank all of my loyal patrons for continuing to support my channel and make videos like this possible. However, I must give special thanks to the following patrons and YouTube backers in particular for their much appreciated pledges. Grady Haynes, Mitchell Valentino, Seth A. Robinson, Carl Olsen, Dos Gamer Man, Sonic Mania 999, Paul Daniel, Andrew McKay, Retro Resolution, Matt Standish, James Taylor, Trogdor the Burninator, Mins, 8 Guy, Luke MC, and Electron Star Collapse. If you also want to help support all my creative endeavours, including this YouTube channel, then please go and check out my Patreon right now. You can get access to pro content, including downloads, exclusive videos, creative insights, and much more besides. I've been the Laird, I thank you for watching, and I'll see you all again for another video very soon.